Good Sunday morning. We're grateful you joined us this morning at Harris Chapel. It's March 29th, 2020, and we welcome you wherever you're watching today. As we're watching the news this week, and of course, I'm not going to talk much about it, we understand that truly this is a crisis. We understand that we're living in days like never before, at least in my lifetime, because as I was a child, I was too young to remember when President Kennedy was assassinated. Didn't know much during the other part of the 60s except into the 70s when things started changing with Watergate and all kinds of other activity. I guess things I remembered a lot in school were things like the NASA space program, uh, the Olympics. Those were world events that meant a lot to me. But this morning, we want to gather together, and uh, since we're self-quarantining, we don't have any kind of worship service, but we have this time just between you and myself. Again, thanks for joining us. I've been listening this week to John Maxwell, and some of you I've referenced on my Facebook page, the material from John Maxwell, a guy I've listened to for over 30 years now. And he was talking about this uh, COVID-19 crisis, and he said, in life... Whatever we go through, we're either the bird or we're the statue. He said, right now, it's kind of like we're all the statue <laughs> and we're getting dumped on. So how are we going to navigate this? How are we going to walk through this? The thing I love about Maxwell is he says, we can use this crisis time, and I want to just open the sermon with this today. Think about this. As an opportunity to move from our comfort zone to our creativity zone. You say, Jim, how does that tie into a sermon and you being a preacher and what are we supposed to do, how we're supposed to respond? We'll just buckle up and hang on. We'll get there. This creativity, let me illustrate it this way. We as a church have been involved in reaching into the community, uh, checking on people every week, people on our directory. Do you have food? Do you need food? Do you uh, need any other uh, supplies? How about your neighbors? How are things with your job? We've had meaningful conversations. This week I've learned to be, and I'm still learning, to be a better listener, to make sure that as people are sharing their hearts that I'm truly engaged in listening. It's been a, a blessing because we've gone beyond what usually happens in the four-year at church with, with this idea of, hi, how are you doing? Fine, glad to see you, blah, 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 to truly listening to each other. This creativity idea, I love how in, in times of crisis, creativity comes out. Eva Johnson this week, for instance, Eva loves to sew. And so Eva, she has a granddaughter who, who is a medical uh, professional. And so Eva has been sewing surgical masks because she said her granddaughter tells her that the medical professionals would rather have the cloth surgical masks because they are easier to adjust and adjust properly and adjust tightly around their face. So Eva has moved out of her comfort zone into her creativity zone to make a difference. Maybe as we're here this morning and I'm preaching at you, talking with you, whatever you call it, you can be thinking about ways to get creative in the midst of this crisis. And can I just tell you, when all this is over, our world will not be the same. It won't be the same. So here's the story. It's like Chuck Swindoll in his recount of a bird, a parakeet, by the name of Chippy. Swindoll tells the story this way. One day, Chippy's owner decided it was time to clean out Chippy's birdcage. Of course, there were feathers and food and droppings in the bottom of the cage, and the owner decided to take the vacuum cleaner, put it in the bottom of the cage, the, the, you know, the, the, the wand, and as soon as she had put the wand in the bottom of the cage, the phone rang. And she set the wand down, it tipped up, and all of a sudden, whoosh, the bird was gone. Uh, the, the, the lady had ignored the bird just for a split second and she heard that sucking sound, turned around and realized that Chippy was no longer there. And so she stopped, frantically hung up the phone and went over and did what she knew to do. She turned off the vacuum, opened up and here was this parakeet covered in dust and all kinds of garbage. And so she rushed Chippy from the birdcage into the bathroom and put Chippy under the faucet or in the shower and started the water. And of course, all the water comes rushing down on Chippy. And, and sure enough, the bird is cleaned off but soaked. She felt sorry for Chippy and, and she went and, and, and took Chippy and got the hairdryer and blew off Chippy. And of course, if you can imagine being a parakeet sucked in a vacuum cleaner, drenched under rushing water, 
and then blown off. And for a parakeet, that blow dryer had to seem like the, the blow dryer that you get going through one of those automated car washes. Swindoll concludes by this. Uh, Chippy doesn't sing much anymore. <laughs> well, here's the story. We may feel like in these days we've been sucked in and we've been blown out. But I can tell you, we can still keep singing. Just like I did last Sunday, I want to give you three things I saw that to me were like the top three things on, uh, on my feed this week that were humorous, and I want to share those with you. been doing a lot of uh, Zoom meetings, and maybe you've done that too, Skyping Zoom. Uh, this I thought was really neat. Check this out. This is a diagram of a Zoom meeting attention span. And it has all these things over to the side, like relief at seeing other human beings, removal of kids from the bedroom, uh, making sure my hair looks fine, and really does my neck always look like that. And only here at the top is a tiny little sliver that we're actually caring <laughs> about the meeting. I thought that was a good one. Here's another one I thought, social distancing, a social distancing baptistry. You like that? Those could become the rage after all this is over. And then one more that may be just out there on the edge a little bit. How about this one? This is a dad joke, okay? Ran out of toilet paper, now using lettuce leaves. Today was just the tip of the iceberg. Tomorrow remains to be seen. <laughs> I know that's poor. But anyway, moving forward. I want to tell you one more thing before we jump into the scripture. By the way, if you have a Bible, find it, get it. We're going to start in just a second. We're going to be in the book of Colossians in the New Testament, okay? The letter to the church of Colossians in the New Testament, just right after Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, then Colossians. They're about halfway through the New Testament. But I want to tell you something. We don't know when this is going to be over. We don't know when we're going to be back in the building. But can I just tell you one thing? That is, the first Sunday we're back in the building here at Harris Chapel, we're going to call it Easter. My friend Mark Elsesser shared that with me the other day, and I just latched onto it. I encourage you, if you're in a church family somewhere out there, would you just notify your church leadership and say, you know what? Whether it's later in April or May or whenever we get back in our worship center, we're going to call that Sunday Easter. It's going to be a day of new beginnings, a fresh start. It's going to be an exciting time. And my prayer, as we, as we walk through this, my prayer is that through this time, and this is a worldwide pandemic, you understand, over 150 countries around the world are affected. I talked to somebody just the other day who has family in New Zealand. New Zealand is on a four-week lockdown. That's how serious it is. Serious it is. So, so as we're walking through this, understand that at some point, the, 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 uh, uh, the whatever you call it, the curtailment is going to be lifted and we're going to be able to get back in our churches. And when we do, we're going to call that Sunday Easter. New start, new beginning, resurrection. Let's pray and we'll get started, okay? In fact, let's do this. Let's pray together the Lord's Prayer because you can do that right where you're at. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. And say it with me. Amen. Amen. Okay, so today as we're in this, 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 this message, we're going to talk about two words and then we're going to get into the book of Colossians. The two words are this, the word vigilance and the word diligence. There are two words that are very close in meaning, but at the same time, very specific. I, I want you to latch onto that in the message this morning. Vigilance and diligence. Okay, vigilance. First of all, vigilance has to do with watchfulness or awareness. The reason I mention the word vigilance is because I believe for us, especially for those of us who call on Jesus as our Savior, as our Lord, that we are called to be aware of what's going on in our world. We're, we're vigilant. We're watching day and night. Every opportunity that comes our way, we're jumping right in. We're not having to, to just stop and weigh it out. We're like, God wants me to do that. I'm going to minister to that need right now. We are vigilant. We are aware. Hand in hand, a little bit different though, is diligence. And we're going to dive in and talk about the word diligence this morning. Because diligence means vigilance, awareness. Diligence means engagement. And so what it is, we're, we're aware of what's going around us. And then we're going to be diligent to continually 
be actively engaged in what God wants us to do. That's what we're talking about today. Okay, now let's 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 break it down. Colossians, join me in Colossians if you would, okay? Here's the story. Paul is in prison. Okay, And when Paul is in prison, we're we're not talking about a prison that has a a workout facility or a library or some kind of IT center where you can learn skills. We're we're talking about a prison that's like the prison. If you ever saw the movie with Jim Caviezel, The Count of Monte Cristo, we're talking about something like that island prison where there are rats, where there's water just kind of here and there and, and it's musty and it's drizzly and it stinks, and there's no bathrooms, and there's no showers, and, and food gets slid in and out under the door. We're, this is the kind of place Paul was, okay? So if you have your Bibles, we're in Colossians, and in the midst of all that, Paul writes this beautiful letter to the church, a church that he was helpful in starting, whether or not he actually was there. It, it's the fact that he helped start that church, and Paul writes this letter. I'm going to give you three different things to draw out of Colossians this morning. And the first one is found in Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. I love how the writer just unfolds all this stuff about how God is present in our world. I share that with you today in the context of what we're dealing with in our world in this whole coronavirus crisis. Because I want you to remember Jesus is present in our world. And when you look at this down to verse 17, and this is the first point I want you to get this morning as we're talking together. As Jesus is there, it says in chapter 1 of Colossians, verse 17, in Jesus, everything is held together. Think about that. It doesn't look, and and I've watched news conferences from our governor and from our president and all the different people on social media and the news outlets that are talking about this, that, and the other. And, And it's just like, we need to understand No matter how the governor sees it, the president, the media, the social media, no matter, understand this basic fact. Point number one, Jesus, in him, everything is held together. Everything is held together. That just means the world to me. In fact, I've been watching those press conferences and, and, and watching the governor press conference, the president press conference, and I'm like, wouldn't it be great if somebody in that, in that news media crew would just say, Mr. President or Governor Holcomb in Indiana, how can we pray for you? What, what can we do to help you as a leader as you are working to help us? I was thinking about that one day. I thought, wouldn't it be so great? Or, or if the president or the governor, whoever would just stop and say, would you just mind if we just pray right now? I thought, wouldn't that be amazing? As I was talking to myself, thinking through that, the Lord came to me and said, Jim, that's your job. That's your job. See, I have God's word. I have the Bible. It's it's right here with us today. It's this word that tells us clearly in Colossians chapter 1, in this world, Jesus is present. He was present even back in the creation If you read through Colossians, and I encourage you to do it, it'll only take you about 15 minutes to read through the whole letter. Jesus is at the center, and in Jesus, everything is held together. You may be off work. You may be working reduced hours. You may be struggling to make ends meet. But understand this. It's our job to know and to realize and to tell others around us, Jesus is at the center of this, and in Jesus, everything is held together together. That's, that's point number one. Now in chapter two, the writer, Paul, who's in prison is saying this, if you're in Jesus, since you've received Jesus, walk in him rooted, built up and established in the faith. That's in Colossians chapter two, verse six. Let me look at it with you. Colossians chapter two, verse six, Paul's saying, if you're in Jesus, if you're in the faith, walk in it, rooted in it, Built up, established. First of all, we said Jesus, in him, everything's held together. And second of all, if we're in him, we understand everything is held together in him. Walk like it. In other words, live like it. Uh, I'm a big fan of John Wayne. Over at the house in the office, we've got a a beautiful John Wayne painting. And he's got that look on, on 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 his face like, what are you looking at? I'm John Wayne. Just get used to it. One of the things I love about John Wayne is not just his language and his skill and and getting things accomplished. What a leader he was. 
But no matter if you watch him in a movie where he's dressed as a cowboy, which was like what I always think of him as, or maybe he was dressed in some kind of military gear, or maybe he was dressed, uh, I don't know, uh, even, even as, as a lawman later on. No matter how he was dressed, he had a walk. He had the John Wayne walk. And when John Wayne walked into a room, into a situation, you just knew that even if you didn't see his face, by the way he walked, the same thing is true for us as Christians. There ought to be a walk in our lives that's evident. People should see that. In the midst of these times, people should see that there are people around who are filled with hope, who are filled with encouragement, who know that even when we come out on the other side of this thing, we're going to be better off. Again, i got to tell you this. I've shared this throughout the week in some of the little vignettes on Facebook Live. Our world will be different. Our world will be different. It, it already is different, and it'll even be more different after this is over. You remember after, after 9-11. At airports now, security looks different than it did before 9-11. I can just tell you now, social distancing, our interactions will look different. See, my hope is this, is not just the spiritual, I'm sorry, not just the physical stuff that'll look different, but for us, the spiritual that will look different. Because since this is happening worldwide, spiritually, we can have an awakening worldwide. I know the media won't talk about that. It'll be about tracking the number of cases, how many people recovered, when are we going to have a, a, a fix to all this, when can we get back to work, all these other things. But I just want to just insert this in your thinking today that Jesus has it all held together and in him we can walk in a way that offers hope and a reality that people may not even be looking for right now. But we can walk in that faith. And what does Paul say? He says this, it's rooted in us, it's building up in us and we are established in that faith. Walk like it. Walk like it. And this is the third thing, okay? Number one, in everything, Jesus holds it all together. We're supposed to walk like it. And the third thing is this, and I love this. He says in chapter three of Colossians, okay? Now we're going to jump to chapter three, verses one and two. He's talking in those verses this. Set your mind on things above. Now that's a powerful principle. Another thing I could grab and go a whole message or series of messages on is in Philippians chapter 4, just a couple books before this. Philippians 4, where he talks about whatever is true and trustworthy and all that. Think on these things. Paul is telling us we, if we're walking in Jesus, we're looking to things above. We, we prayed a while ago the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. And the prayer said this, may your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You understand what that means? That means that our lives here, even in the midst of the crisis, should reflect here what's happening there on earth as it is in heaven. And what is that? The way we know is because we're looking up. We're seeking the things that are above. We're setting our mind on the things that are above. See, as the dust settles, as life goes back to what life was like when people went back to work and we were eating at restaurants and, and socializing and working out at the health club and all these things, as that resumes, my prayer is that these three things will somehow be ingrained in our brain. Today, everything's held together in Jesus. When we go back to work, everything's held together in Jesus. When we go back to the why, everything's held together in Jesus. When we see our friends at the mall or wherever else, a restaurant, everything's held together in Jesus. And the second thing is this, we're going to walk and live like that. And the third thing is we're going to keep looking up. We're going to keep looking up. What does that mean? This idea of being vigilant. I'm going to keep being aware of my world, my surroundings. And diligent means I'm going to keep focused. There's another scripture, I'm not going to really dig into it. In Colossians 3, 23, he goes on and he says, listen, whatever you do, you're doing it as unto the Lord. Work at it with all your might. That's diligence. We're called to be diligent. We're called to be giving it 100%. I had a friend that wrote a book 
entitled Go Big or Go Home, and it was talking about Nehemiah rebuilding the wall in the Old Testament, that story. My focus is this, go big or go bigger. <laughs> That's what we need to do, folks. This is our time. This is the opportunity we have in, in the body of Jesus to step up and go bigger, to go bigger, to be actively engaged, to be, listen to this, be diligently vigilant. How does that sound? To work hard, as hard as we can, to be aware of what's happening around us. In fact, he says, make the most, in another scripture in, over in Ephesians, he says, make the most of every opportunity. Make the most of every opportunity. One translation says, redeem the time, which means make the most of every opportunity. In the original language, that was, that was, that was two words that were crammed together that we in English just say, redeem the time or make the most of every opportunity. One part of that word was buy up at the marketplace. This is interesting. You're going to relate here. Buy up at the marketplace and at the same time, take full advantage. Make most of buying up at the marketplace. And I thought for fun, I'd just kind of wind it down by mentioning this. Maybe you know, and, and if we were on, uh, oh, I don't know, uh, Steve Harvey's show and, and talking about Family Feud, that's it. You know, the top 10 answers. When a crisis comes, survey of 100 people, the top 10 answers are on the board, and you start guessing. Of course, our joke would be this, well, a toilet paper. Or like when I went into Rule King a week ago, ammunition. Do you understand that those things come in at number 10? They're number 10. Yet in our world, we joke and even shared a joke earlier like that was the top thing. Well, let me just give you the top things, okay? Number one is water. And you go down the list, uh, dried fruit, vegetables, cereal, canned meat, pasta slash sauces, nuts slash seeds, juices slash powdered milk, oil and seasonings, comfort foods. And finally, at number 10, we see toilet paper and ammo. I want to encourage you as we wind this down, and thanks for watching today, I want to encourage you to understand Jesus is at the center of this and it's all being held together in him. I want you to understand he wants to help you and me to be firmly rooted and established so that we can walk through this crisis victoriously. And more than anything, I want you to understand this. We're called to look up, to seek him to seek his direction for our lives. I'd like to pray with you and this video will be going up on YouTube and you can check out our church at your leisure at harrischapelnaz.com H-A-R-R-I-S-C-H-A-P-E-L Naz, N-A-Z.com Feel free if you have any questions, have any needs, or if you know of anybody that has needs, call us 765-748- 3284. I'll repeat that. 765-748-3284. That gets us here at the church. I appreciate you and, and we'll whatever we can pray with you about. Uh, I got to say thank you also. Our people have been amazing uh, with offerings and giving above and beyond. Uh, you're welcome to do that. No compulsion, but uh, I want to say a special thank you because uh, we've been reaching out to a lot of folks and I appreciate your support in doing that. I don't hardly ever talk about offering because the main thing I want you to know is Jesus. And as we pray, I want to invite you. Uh, this is your time. H how is your relationship with Jesus? Sometimes I talk to people and say, hey, how are you? well, I'm trying. Well, it's so much more than that. It's accepting him into your heart and into your life. I did that back in a youth group of May of 1978 and life has never been the same. Learned a lot. I continue to learn a lot. But it starts with a decision to say, you know what, Jesus? I want to take my focus of me being at the center of my world and put you at the center of my world. Let's pray about that and then we'll sign off. Thanks again for tuning in. Dear Jesus, I thank you so much for each person that's watching this YouTube video today. Lord, I understand that these are crazy times, but I understand that you're a great God. You're going to see us through it. Lord, I pray you give us wisdom. Give us that vigilance, that awareness of what we need to do 
of, first of all, what we need to be aware of. Give us ears to hear. Give us hands to respond. Give us a mind that is molded and shaped after your mind. And Lord, help us to be diligent as well. As we're aware, help us to be engaged. We love you. We praise you. We thank you for another Sunday. Until we can get together again, Jesus, we're just going to do this. And we're going to know that you can meet with us wherever we are. The sanctuary that we are in doesn't necessarily need to have a steeple on it. It could be a mobile device. It can be a laptop. Just wherever we're at. We give you thanks and praise. And everybody says together, amen. Amen. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great day.